My name's Max Feinstein, and I'm an anesthesiologist filming here in New York City at Mount Sinai Hospital. In this video, I'm gonna be taking you inside an operating room with an actual surgery going on where the patient goes on to cardiopulmonary bypass. This video does not provide medical advice, and while the patient is not shown and no patient information is displayed in this video, the patient did consent to having filming being done while the surgery was going on. This video was also approved by Mount Sinai's Department of Anesthesiology as well as the hospital's press office. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribed to the channel. Let's dive in. We are sitting here with the attending anesthesiologist for the case, Dr. Benji Salter. Help me understand a little bit about the nature of the case that we're looking at today. So today's case is an on-pump coronary artery bypass case. This is a patient with known diabetes and coronary artery disease, which has just significantly gotten worse to the point where the patient is experiencing dyspnea and exertion, had a positive stress exam as well, which led to a coronary catheterization, which revealed all the vascular disease. The term on pump refers to rerouting blood from the patient's heart and lungs into this bypass machine run by a specially trained perfusionist. The heart is then intentionally arrested so that it's motionless, which allows the surgeon to then graft blood vessels from other parts of the patient's body to go around the diseased coronary arteries. Hence the term coronary artery bypass graft, or cabbage as it's commonly referred to. What was the preparation like for this case? The preparation for our cases always start the night before. I was able to communicate with both my resident and my fellow last night. We spoke briefly about hemodynamic goals, the patient's medical history, the different lines, monitors that we were gonna to use today, and we kind of came up with a plan and then all met again with the patient this morning. This is a very major operation. And I think that, that the level of anxiety is a lot different relative to another surgery. So it really is our responsibility to ease their anxiety, prepare them for what is to come, both initially and then afterwards. And so I think having that conversation and, and treating them like a family member or a friend is really important because when they come in the room and they see there's five other support staff in there and they see all the monitors and they see the perfusionist and all their equipment, you're very, very scared. But I think this is really what sets the really good anesthesiologists from everybody else, which is our ability to establish a rapport with our patients. In addition to meeting with the patient, the anesthesiology team prepared the room. The mnemonic MS MADES is often used to recall the components of an anesthesia setup, where M stands for machine check, S for suction, another M for monitors, which includes pulse oximetry, EKG, blood pressure, which in this case will be monitored with an arterial line placed with ultrasound guidance, a bispectral index monitor to measure depth of anesthesia, and a cerebral oximeter to measure cerebral oxygen saturation. The A stands for airway, which includes a laryngoscope that facilitates placement of an endotracheal tube. I for IV, which in this case includes special tubing with a filter to allow safe administration of blood products, as well as a central line that will be placed in the patient's neck to allow for safe delivery of vasopressors, as well as central venous pressure monitoring. The D in MS MADE stands for drugs. Cardiac surgery requires preparing many medications, which I go over in more detail in the video linked in the top right. It's worth pointing out that the anticoagulant heparin plays a particularly vital role in preventing complications while on bypass. The last S in the mnemonic stands for special equipment, and in this case, we'll have electrodes attached to the patient in case we need to deliver shocks. Throughout the surgery, we'll also be using transesophageal echocardiography, for which cardiac anesthesiologists are specially trained. With everything set up, we now wheel the patient back to the operating room and start placing monitors. Those include cerebral oxygen saturation, as well as a bispectral index monitor to get pre-induction baseline readings, as well as a pre-induction arterial line. This allows us to monitor a patient's blood pressure continuously, which is especially important when inducing anesthesia for patients with severe cardiovascular disease. This is a sterile procedure that starts with administering lidocaine to make it less uncomfortable since the patient's awake. It's common to use ultrasound guidance, although anesthesiologists can also perform this procedure by feel alone. This is what the continuous blood pressure waveform looks like from an arterial line. Next, anesthesia is carefully induced with a combination of fentanyl and propofol, 
followed by the paralytic rocuronium to facilitate intubation and keep the patient's body motionless during surgery. Once the patient is under general anesthesia, an endotracheal tube is inserted to support the patient's breathing during surgery. Now we get ready to place the central line, which is a sterile procedure. I notably made my useful contribution to this case by helping Dr. Stannard put on his sterile gown. You're welcome. Then Dr. Poulajal prepared a nine French central line with a triple lumen catheter, which is how we can safely administer vasopressors, measure central venous pressure, and deliver fairly substantial volumes of fluid through the large catheter. A sterile drape is placed over the patient, then using ultrasound guidance, a needle is inserted into the patient's internal jugular vein. Ultrasound helps us make certain that the needle is in the vein, not in a major artery, which could be catastrophic. Not shown was the placement of a transthoracic echocardiography probe, which helps us to confirm the proper placement of the central line by seeing a wire passing into the patient's heart. The catheter can then be placed over the wire, which is known as the Seldinger technique, and our central line is done. With the patient under general anesthesia and the lines in place, the surgeons can now start the case. The entire time, you know, we kind of keep our heads on a swivel, we're remaining vigilant, we're really monitoring hemodynamics, uh, communicating with the surgeons about hemodynamic goals. Our responsibility, in addition to all that right now, is a thorough echo exam. Not only do we want to evaluate this patient's function, because they are coming in for a coronary artery bypass, but we want to make sure that there are no valvular abnormalities, no pathology that wasn't expected. Lots of our patients have a very thorough workup. There are CT scans, there are pre-op echoes, but things change. We want to make sure there's no new disease that was unknown prior to starting the surgery because more often than not, it can change the course of surgery whether that's what they're gonna address when they're actually on pump, whether it's gonna change how they cannulate, all of those findings that we see may alter the course of the surgery. As we perform the initial echocardiography exam, the surgeons are performing several steps simultaneously. One is opening the chest, which is called a sternotomy, while at the same time, the blood vessels are being harvested from various parts of the body, including the leg, the arm, or the chest itself. These blood vessels will eventually be grafted onto the heart to bypass the diseased coronary arteries. Once the blood vessels have been harvested, the team gets ready to go on to cardiopulmonary bypass so the heart can be stopped and operated on. Part of the preparation process entails the surgeons inserting cannulae into the patient's major blood vessels to take blood out of the heart, run it through the bypass machine, and then return it back to the patient's body. The anesthesia team assists the surgeons with cannula placement by confirming proper location on echo. A crucial safety mechanism before going on to bypass includes heparinizing the patient, which means administering the anticoagulant heparin so the patient's blood doesn't clot. It's really important so that we don't have any, you know, uh, clotting situation or, you know, maybe a, a thrombus formation, embolus during or in the pump or on any of the membranes of the pump or in the field, we want to make sure the patient's really adequately anticoagulated so that uh, they're not at risk for, for any of those insults. Once heparinized, we can now go on to cardiopulmonary bypass with the heart-lung machine. Next, in order to stop the heart so it can be operated on, a solution known as cardioplegia is routed through the heart. Cardioplegia contains large amounts of potassium, which is ultimately responsible for arresting the heart. Here, the EKG actually shows the heart slowing down and then finally stopping. At this point, the surgeons start to graft the harvested blood vessels onto the heart to bypass the diseased coronary arteries. In addition to being the attending anesthesiologist for this case, you are also the program director for the Cardiothoracic Anesthesiology Fellowship Program here at Mount Sinai Hospital. What has that been like for you? This has been one of the most fantastic experiences I've ever had in my career. We have seven current fellows. We're gonna have eight in the upcoming academic year. It really is an honor to be able to bridge them between residency and when they become attendings and, and work with them to develop their skills as cardiothoracic anesthesiologists. Someone who's just watching this video might think that the fellow is actually the attending, the way that she's interacting with the resident, teaching, pushing medications. So in my experience, it's been very impressive to see 
the level of autonomy and independence that fellows get, and even residents who have gotten experience in the operating rooms. I think that that's part of the spectrum of growing as a house staff member. You start off as a CA1 and you're not really working independently. And as you start to grow as a CA2 and a 3 and you come to cardiac and you come to thoracic, we get to kind of develop a rapport. And, and as you learn, you gain independence. And then as you become a fellow, we have this idea of conditional independence. And you've already mastered general anesthesia. And that's why you're here now, is to really learn how to master cardiac anesthesia and cardiothoracic anesthesia. So we work very hard for the first, let's say six to nine months in developing independence and strength and a foundation so that you really can become independent by the end of the kind of third quarter of the year going into the end of the year. Why would someone choose to go into cardiothoracic anesthesiology? I think that in my mind, cardiothoracic anesthesia really encompasses so many of the things as that we, that we need to know as an anesthesiology. It encompasses um, very, very sick patients and the management of their pathology, invasive monitoring, whether it's central line placement, arterial line placement, transesophageal echocardiography, which is really important and a, and a, and a great tool to have. And I think it's exciting. And I think it really provides very rewarding work to see a very sick patient improve after surgery and then thereafter over time. One of the things that I've heard about cardiothoracic anesthesiologists is that they basically provide guidance for the surgeons as they're going through the surgery. Can you speak to that a little bit? Let's say you're going to do a mitral valve repair or an aortic valve repair. It really is reliant on the anesthesiologist to tell the surgeon what's the mechanism of the pathology so that the surgeon can plan and, and make decisions as the surgery is continuing. What do you need to do to get prepared to come off of bypass? Does this patient have a low ejection fraction? Are they gonna need inotropic support? Will they need mechanical circulatory support? So we really start to think about not only do they need support hemodynamically or whatever it is, but what kind of support are they gonna have? So once we've had that discussion, we all come up with a formal plan, the clamp comes off, we kind of reperfuse the heart, and then we start to make decisions based on what we're seeing. How does the function look? How does the valve repair or replacement look? Are we satisfied with everything? Do we need to go back on bypass to repair, replace, continue to work? We're always dynamically you know, changing our decision-making as we go through this whole process. So we're, we're prepared with everything and, uh, and move forward with that. Coming off of bypass frequently entails using a temporary pacemaker to keep the heart beating regularly. The pacemaker is typically removed from the patient after a relatively short period of time once the heart is beating well on its own. Another vital aspect of coming off of bypass is reversing the anticoagulation from heparin, which we do using a medication called protamine that's very carefully administered. And so we come off of bypass, the surgery finishes, the surgeons are done closing, and the patients typically stay intubated for a period of time, and we go up to the ICU, and Patients typically are extubated within, what would you say? Hopefully within a couple hours. That's really the goal in our ICU. I think once they're hemodynamically stable, we're monitoring various drains, chest tube output, making sure there's no coagulopathy, the sooner the better, really, in our ICU. They do a great job of extubating as soon as the patient is ready. For anybody who's interested in the cardiothoracic anesthesia program at Mount Sinai, where can they find more information? We do have a divisional website, so when you find our departmental website, you can click on the cardiothoracic division. There's a fantastic introductory video on there, contact information for myself and for our program coordinator. We're all very open and, and readily available and excited to answer questions about the program. I really appreciate your time and the opportunity to bring a camera inside an operating room and film these cases. Even though I'm not going into cardiac anesthesia, it does have a spot in my heart, forgive the pun. That is why I did an extra rotation with you and it's just great to be able to be in the operating room and share that with Absolutely. my YouTube channel. So thanks a ton, Benji. Fantastic, thanks for having me, I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to check out this video where I show what it's like as a resident being on call for cardiac anesthesia. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.